guest today is uh, Patricia Swannell, who is a Canadian. She, is, she lives in London. Patricia was born in Canada. She grew up in Toronto and in Newfoundland. And we will come to describe to you what Newfoundland is for those who uh, don't know. She is an economist. She graduated from the uh, University of Toronto with an e MA in economics and then decided to go to London to get a, a job as an investment banker. Uh, I don't know if you were planning to go there for a short period of time or it was a, a lifelong decision, but you stayed in the city for 20 years, having a very successful career in finance. And then you decided that you were going to take the opportunity for a, a retirement uh, opportunity and go and explore uh, the other side of your brain. And you took some art courses that led to a degree in fine art at the City and Guilds of London University in printmaking. Uh, very successfully, you received uh, multiple prizes, in particular, uh, you received twice the uh, City and Gold's Printmaking Prize for Technical Excellence and the same prize as uh, for Best Contributor to the Humanities Program. And you also um, were scooped up by Jagged Art uh, Gallery. Andrea is here uh, upon graduating and you have been showing there uh, ever since. So I think that the first question I want to ask you is, why trees? Oh, interesting. Uh, well, first to say, welcome to everyone and thank you for, for coming. Um, the introduction makes the whole uh, history sound a great deal more planned than it was. But it was really a question of, 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 of looking at the opportunities uh, that were available at each point in time and really finding something to be excited about. Uh, and, and it's actually quite a good question, Isabel, about why trees? Because after a long career, in, well, felt long, uh, in investment banking, which I, I enjoyed in very many ways, like a complex puzzle, and you feel competitive and you think I could do that as well as the next man. And I wasn't really certain when I had the opportunity to do anything I wanted to, what I might be able to do. And it was only experimenting with uh, art courses that allowed me to discover that I really, really enjoyed learning about things in a kind of, with my hands and, uh, and making images and coming to some kind of a different kind of understanding through those materials than I might have done through numbers, which was the first way I learned to navigate the world. So while I was in the process of going through the uh, fine art training, I got to say I had a, a bit of a crisis of conscience and I thought, why should I bother making an image? Why am I looking at this? Why does it justify my attention and effort? And really when I tried to think about what was important in the world now, our relationship with the natural world seems critically important. Uh, I really questioned, no doubt from the economic side of my brain, about how we value nature, how we disregard and ignore the incredible and necessary foundation that nature provides. And trees became a really powerful metaphor or symbol for me because it, obviously we need them to generate the oxygen. We all know about the importance that, that um, trees, the important role trees play in sequestering carbon. Um, but there, there was also a really interesting and I thought wonderful poetic feeling about a tree that really appealed to me. And I, I just love the idea that it spans, if you like, the world so that the roots are in the earth, below the earth where we, where we live. And then the, you know, the trees and things reach up to the heaven beyond us. And so it's not just a question of how it relates to us as human beings in 
creating oxygen and sequestering the carbon in going to places we can't reach below the earth and places we can't reach above us. But it also is in terms of time really interesting because the tree that we plant now, and I, in some of the projects we're involved in, in planting trees, we will never experience that tree in its mature form. We always do it for the future. And all those maybe not even so exciting trees that we encounter every day required somebody a generation past to, to actually plant. So the idea of the kind of connections created by a tree, I think made it feel like a really, really powerful uh, symbol, metaphor, uh, item to really explore. So I've been playing around with trees and, and nature really ever since. So have you been using the same uh, methodology or did you find inspiration in the methodology that the uh, uh, economic uh, projection you're trying to project what it's going to be in the future and look at all the elements that come into that projection and, and see what's going to happen. Has that been coming into your practice, that kind of thinking? Well, it, it, well it's hard. I mean, it's quite interesting because it's really rather hard to stop that part of your brain that likes to see things really ordered and systematic and understand the relationships. That was all my formal training. And one of the really interesting, and it has to be said, humiliating experiences of going to art college was to realize that there were different ways to approach understanding something. So one of the things that I really, uh, I think it's fair to say really enjoy is trying to find ways of working that bring together that kind of thinking about things and actually doing things and actually doing things and then seeing what they actually communicate. Uh, coming up with something that I'm trying to communicate and trying lots of different ways in order to make it clear. So it's, it, the, the, they often talk within the fine art world of the space in between. And that I find quite a useful idea. So I'm trying to find something that is seems beautiful, seems interesting, seems engaging, but has a kind of reason for being there. So it's trying to find the, t the places where the two sides of, um, you know, I think the emotional, the spiritual, and the analytical, and, and, and numerical and intellectual actually find a place where they rest happily together. Right. So are you surprised when you um, exhibit a new work and you stand in the background listening to what the viewers are sharing because people when you go to a gallery people always comment and if you uh, if you put the fly on the wall are you surprised sometimes at what they see in it and and are you uh, are you hurt when they don't get your message or they get something different no i i think that I, i'm often flabbergasted um sometimes really delighted sometimes completely, uh, you know, confused as to how on earth. But the whole purpose, the whole reason, as far as I'm concerned, is, is to kind of have that opportunity to have another pair of eyes look at it and then observe what they take from it. I mean, obviously, I enjoy making the images. I enjoy doing it like, like research to try to find out what might work, what it might say, how it might change if I do certain things. And then it's such a fantastic opportunity to put them in a space where I can stand back and watch a person encounter that object, that experiment. And that's why um, you know, Andrea's gallery is such an incredible gift as far as I'm concerned to me because the whole reason for doing it is to actually see what it communicates, to kind of see what's happening when another human being looks at that. And what I'm really trying to, um, what I'm trying to achieve is that if I see something magical or significant or important in, in, in an item or an image, something that I value, is that somebody else finds that same value, which perhaps they haven't seen before. 
that feels like a really rich reward. And that is why I do it. Am I insulted? No, because I slightly, and it's not good news for Andrea, I insulate myself and I always think about my work as experiments and any image is just the byproduct of working something out. I cannot think of it and feel comfortable if I think about it as a performance or a production or a product that I'm trying to <clears throat> aim for. That makes it feel far too personal as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um, and then I would feel wounded if people didn't like it. But because I don't allow myself to think it, it, it that way, I feel sort of protected. And I'm really just very interested to hear what people say, even if I conclude that they're totally wrong. You know, I... So you have an interesting uh, ownership relationship to your work. I mean, um, you are able to emotionally distance yourself from your work because you don't see it as a performance and as a product, but just as an, an, as an evolution. Is that what you're saying? I... I see it as a kind of research process, and I want to take it to the stage where I feel it's beautiful and sympathetic and, uh, and interesting and communicates something valuable and useful, but it may well go back to my training as an economist. I'm not really, I find it very hard to feel motivated to make a product just because somebody wants to buy it, or you find some of the prints, and most of the prints, for instance, are, uh, they're complex to create. They're unique, each one of them, unique kind of aquatints, the way that I layer the images. And I found people, I hate to say, it, sort of major international retailers who like an image and want to put it on a poster. And, you know, you could print, 500 you think no that's that's really not the point for me right um the point is is not to create a product but to create just some sort of avenue of communication and it probably is a little bit self-protection to not uh not create somebody something that is you know like i peel back the curtain and say ta-da this is it um, it's much easier to sh show my work by saying, I'm going to try something out and let's see what you think. So I'm sharing something rather than selling something. Right. So when do you decide that the experiment um, is complete and the, the product is ready to be shared? If it's an experiment without having an end goal, when do you decide that now is the right time to share it? Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, I can take them to a kind of series. I could, and, and I, I, theoretically, I think I will do that. But realistically, my dear friend Andrea will tell me there's a show at a certain date and uh, this is the theme and these are the walls and I'll show where I have arrived at that point. But there will be you know, there's a sense that it will never be finished and I don't want it to be finished. One of the joys of working as an artist, and I, I, I strongly recommend it to everyone, is that you can continue to be an artist and this, this way of working in particular, when I don't feel I have to sell it to be, be fulfilled, um, is that I can work till I'm 99, if my right. hands are still able, so there's no sense of, of, of an end. It's just a way of encountering the world, of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a lovely way. It's a lovely way to make a communication with people, a really exciting way to make a communication with people that you wouldn't meet otherwise, that you would never encounter in the normal course of your life. And I cannot tell you how thrilling it is to find somebody who has something ostensibly with nothing in common with you and yet you find a kind of connection it is so satisfying and so thrilling that that for me is reward enough 
you know, yeah. it's a huge room. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I think it's uh, from having spoken to artists, they um, always, oh, not always, but almost always say that's a very high point, but there are some artists who are unable even to go there and to connect um, directly with the, the buyers of their art because it's just even that is too much for them. But uh, uh, so we, yeah. we spoke about trees and in your, uh, in your explanation, you mentioned the concept of time, which is a very important concept in your practice. And I'd like to share the photo. So bear with me, I seem to be technologically challenged today, but I am going to share the screen. Um, and um, can you see uh, this photo? Ah. W would you like me to describe it? Yes, Isabel? so I'd like you to describe what this is and how the concept of time comes into that and give the title and all that. Yeah, uh, so th th this is a, a one, an example of, uh, of a series of drawings that I've been doing for several years now uh, and something I really, I really enjoy. And what I think of them as is a time portrait of trees. So as you see in front of you, I find a seed from a specific tree. So I'm, that's identified with an, an, a tree that I, that I know, and I, I, I recognize that one. That is a tree in the church from the churchyard of Marylebone Parish Church. Um, a very, very old churchyard, and it's a lime. Uh, and what I will do is take the seed as the starting point in time for that tree and do the detailed botanical drawing of that seed. I then in very, very, very tiny handwriting, I'm writing around it the name in English, Latin, and its location. And I'm repeating that again and again in very, very tiny printing in different weights of pencil again and again. And obviously it takes a long time to create these drawings. Uh, and I keep going until I'm the size and the circumference and shape of the tree as it is now, as I have measured it and drawn it and encountered it. And if you like, it's an imagined cross section through the tree. And they look quite pretty and people will come up to them and, and explore what they are. And you can almost always guarantee what they will say to me. Uh, they'll look at that, they'll look at me, they'll look again and say, mm, obsessive compulsive, uh, you know, because that must have taken a really long time. But my, you know, the answer is really not that. What it is, is just a, it did, does, they do take a long time, but everybody understands how long it takes to print. And so they understand that it's a kind of meditation or homage to the amount of time that's crystallized in even quite an ordinary tree. Uh, and so it makes people think about a specific tree. In that case, you could see the tree through the gallery window across the road uh, and understand how much time is actually crystallized in that, in that specimen. So in terms of the, uh, the circles, we saw that there is some uh, empty space between some of the uh, writing. Is that following the lines? Well, no, because you haven't cut the tree necessarily. So that's no. your imagination. It, in a way, it's, it's my imagination, but again, my observation. You know, we obviously know the tree is, is dynamic and growing. It will, that will continue for decades. And so I always insert, and I do that by engineering how I print, a Fibonacci spiral. So a spiral of natural growth. And that's, uh, it makes it feel dynamic to me because you've got the natural pattern of the spiral, which everybody kind of, instinctually knows continues and, and you know, like it's not a closed circle, but something that actually endures and will continue to expand. And to, so it's, it's to suggest that the whole thing is, is dynamic and the tree that I've crystallized at one point in time will continue to grow. Uh, and that's, that's maybe because of my background studying maths, but I kind of, I, kind, I, I like that extra little secret message. <laughs> 
Um, I actually, you sent me a, a video of you um, writing, starting one of your projects. And I just want to share with everybody that I have posted that on my Instagram feed. I created a, a little video and I posted it um, on my Instagram feed. So if anybody is interested in seeing how you work and how meticulous the work is, I, uh, I invite you to go there. Um, why do you think, uh, going back to, to trees and, and the value, uh, as an economist, um, why do you think that we are not valuing trees the way we should or nature the way we should? And is there a parallel between that and how we do not seem to value art the way we should? Because people always think that art is either too expensive or I can do the same, or you know, there's so many people like that. Why do you think this is like that? What's your opinion? I mean, I, th I think there's, I think there's two, two elements in that. I mean, I think we don't value trees because they're public goods. You know, the benefit is very, very widely spread, widely dispersed, and it's very difficult to capture that within a market economy. And, uh, you know, people who cut down the tree, the, the timber and that will, will capture something, but we won't be able to do the same with the services that the tree provides in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, is it related to the way we value art? I would say, you know, in a way, in the sense that markets are imperfect. Commercial markets are imperfect. And uh, I think there's a sense in which it's very difficult to assign a monetary value to, to, to art because um, if you're approaching it as something to fill a space or match your couch, it would have one value and it would be serving that need. If you're looking at it as an expression of creativity, um, you know, a, a, a picture of what is harmonious, you might assign another value. So the kind of extra, the value that the person is purchasing, the subjective value they're getting is gonna be really different depending on how they regard it. So it's not like a, a let's think of a good example, only because I'm looking out of the window, a car that provides transport services and maybe status, you know, that right. produces one kind of a return. Uh, and art, I think, can provide a number of different turns. And I think that's maybe why I don't like thinking of my art as a product, because I really hate to think that having tried so hard to say something meaningful, people just like it because it goes with the sofa. <laughs> you know, that... that <laughs> Okay, let's oh, not go there. <laughs> but it, it's perfectly legitimate, you know. Yes. I, I I agree. With this, but you know, they're just catering for a different need. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'd like to share uh, more photos of your um, uh, of your art. Um, this is a different series, so maybe take us uh, through that series and the process. And then I'll come back to you and maybe you can show us uh, the evolution of that, which uh, you were showing me a little bit earlier with the uh, embroidery on it. Okay, this is quite, this is, this was, uh, I think the next sequence of images are all from um, uh, the same show uh, that was issued um, as a real old challenge, again, by Andrea. Yes. Having done, uh, a, a, um, a commission with uh, another artist that I think Isabel spoke to previously. Um, we, we, we get on extremely well, but work in very different ways. And we did a show together where he challenged me, he told me what to do and said, you should use gold leaf in your images. And, you know, quite honestly, I thought that is absolutely too bling for my taste. It's not really what I'm interested in, but he actually taught me how to put on gold leaf. And when I started playing with it, I thought, well, actually, it's quite interesting because gold says something about 
value. And so it actually drew attention to something very specific and beautiful within the images. So within that series of images, that first one was just highlighting the, uh, the details of a, of a really rather ordinary leaf, but the kind of intense beauty of just the angles and, and, and dimensions of just a pair of leaves. Um, we, we then went to, and I think in that sequence, uh, there was a bit of playing with different other images that allowed um, gold moons to change the dimension, the, 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 the spatial dimensions of what your brain interpreted. So I think the next image kind of, oh no, this, that's the one, yeah. So if you imagine that without the gold, you would simply see the pattern of the leaves, but adding that moon and with the leaves silhouetted told you quite an interesting different story and absolutely punched back the area within the picture frame to be something kind of distant and almost infinite, which I thought, you know, it, it was really quite interesting how that transformed the experience of the image, the perception of the space, and what it might communicate. I also really liked the way that it, can, it, it, it kind of suggested a nighttime, and in terms of if you think that the planet and all is, is, at, is at risk, again, putting trees into a nighttime context seemed you know, a, an interesting way of communicating something, uh, something new. Yeah, and I, I like the fact that it uh, bleeds over the image. And uh, to me, I interpreted that almost as entering the, uh, the real world. Um, oh, yeah. It, it, it's a very it important the thing for me. Yeah, to, to, to where I take the image outside of the picture frame. And it's something that I well, you see within the prints, I often do because it, it's questioning or provoking you to think about the image of, of, of or, or think about where we are, what is our relationship with nature and, and the picture's relationship with nature. And is this actually just recording a history, something that actually has receded that can only be a memory, a ghost of the experience of nature. So Isabel, I think the other image where I've tried to integrate with thread a uh, twig into the um, into the to the print. I think that's yeah. And again, that might be hard to see on the screen. But again, I've looked at kind of connecting an image of nature somehow with a net, um, a matrix, connecting it with, with with something more immediately in the here and now in our world presently. So that again, mm -hmm. you could see how it's it's more a research process as to how a gold connection can actually make a new meaning of, of images. So that was, was playing, playing about. And it, it's quite, well, well, we'll go through the next one and then I can show you what I've been playing about a little bit in lockdown. Um, I just wanted with, to, uh, to share a comment. We have a, a comment in the chat from uh, Carol who says that golden gems allow us to use reflected light to draw the viewer in and even direct their viewing experience towards your expressive interest. And I think that's, that's a really good uh, observation. It's a really good comment that uh, it's a great tool it, for it, the audience. It is. Yeah, it, it is undoubtedly because um, so it was Carol who said that, did you say? Carol. Carol. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, really, uh, a really astute comment because while I have, uh, you know, again, that was taking, working with an image, which is technically just fine, but it didn't give a strong enough composition or focus for me. So it was in my file of, I need to think about that more. Um, and the gold... Trans absolutely spot on, transformed it into a very different uh, message and something that I felt was complete. And I was very happy with it being um, not a final, a completed thought 
you know, it was, it, it was really useful. And this was, again, um, I do a whole series of, of painting. It, it, they're actually relating to time, uh, looking at horizons with uh, different, uh, very, 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 very pale washes of complementary color because it feels to me very dynamic. So there's a sense of a timeless space, a timeless horizon. Uh, they tend to read as space and water. Uh, and this, again, this image of the gold uh, in terms of sunset, again, produced something very different. And I think it's hard to see on screen, but there's a whole series of just straight uh, running stitches in gold that are flowing down from the moon that felt like the kind of uh, twinkles that you see when you're walking next to water. Uh, that yeah. has a little, a, li a little breeze and, and, and shimmer on it. So again, it was looking how that could integrate. And you can see there's a sort of matrix inevitably generated by, uh, by the images. And, and it's, it's a very interesting idea how the stitches integrate the two and, and, and create something, um, something very well. And quite honestly, the friend that the friend uh, the artist that I was collaborating with, he is a friend, uh, taught me some really wonderful uh, techniques for stitching in paper, which uh, stitching is something that I've done since I was a child because my mother was such a, a fantastic needlewoman. And uh, it, it hadn't really uh, occurred to me much to use it on paper. Uh, but that um, the challenge that he gave me made me start to use it on paper, which was really quite uh, fascinating. And we've got a, um, oh, we've got some we've got two questions. So um, uh, Sharon, who I know is uh, actually I think that Sharon and you were in the same uh, workshop with Richard McVettis, possibly. But Sharon uh -huh. is asking um, about the stitching. Is it Sashiko stitching and I think you answered the second question, what is the background? So what is this, the stitching is just a running stitch or is it it's just a stitching? Pure, it's just a pure running stitch um, and uh, it, it's on paper. And so again, it's learning how to, how to do that without destroying the paper. And you know, like, like all artistic techniques, it, it, it takes a little bit of practice in order to do it, but it's, it's quite interesting. And you might be interested to see, I mean, this is, I've got a work in progress that I, I you can see bring from the distance. Yeah. And can I'm going to bring, bring it, it closer bit, now. Closer. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And what, what I, I think is fascinating here, and I'm playing with a, a bigger variety of stitches, uh, Jaron will recognize the fly stitch and I've then put a chain I'm going in as well. But where I've, added no stitching to the gold leaf, it appears to rest on top of the image. But where the stitches are intervening in a kind of intriguing way, because I'm adding another layer, it tends to sink and integrate with the image. So again, I'm just playing with how different stitches can be used. And, and you can probably see it's a very fine gold thread that I'm working with on gold leaf within a print. Um, and it's really just an experiment to see, again, how one can change the nature and message of an image. And this is just, actually probably should be the other way around to make more, more sense. Uh, this is just clover, quite ordinary, but absolutely necessary. Um, and, and it just brings what was really a very dull and, uh, image and create something other and, and, and a better focal point, a very, a more interesting, intriguing kind of image. So I've been, I, I've been playing with that since, uh, since Richard's course. What is the, um, what is the weight of the, what is the paper you're using? This is just Somerset 350 GSM. Okay. Uh, you know, which is just a high, uh, high content, uh, rag content, uh, printmaking paper. So it's, um, there's nothing particularly special about the paper. Um, I just learned uh, to be uh, very attentive to uh, making a, a, a pilot hole in the paper and then being, learning to be incredibly gentle 
with a very fine stitch and a very fine needle in order to place the stitch. You do not have the same, um, for those, and I know people who are used to stitching, you do not have the same uh, flexibility and capacity to, to um, move robustly that you do with fabric. Yeah, so it's course. much more delicate. Mm -hmm. I know that you have hidden away near you some work in progress. Do you want to share that with us and let us know a little bit in the secret of what's coming up? Oh, well, I mean, this is the one that I'm, that I'm playing with now. Right. Um, what, 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 I, what I do have, which is quite, it might be quite interesting to people. I mean, you can see, you know, from the, the, the website and from the gallery website and from the things behind me, the kind of images that I'm working with and the format I come to. Um, but it's quite difficult at that distance to see. And I've got some uh, just, you know, sketchbook pieces. So they're not finished. They're just things that I've been, I, I've worked on. They may be finished someday. They may not. Um, but talking about my, the way that I make the prints, which, you know, I've got an intaglio etching, which is very black, and I'm creating images effectively with masks, but as well as creating the image. So here is an image of, again, another series I did where I was highlighting with dry brush watercolors a certain spotlighted area that links it to the living form. But what I thought might be useful for people was to see the kind of etch and in, that I am creating in the, uh, in the image of the twig. So it's right. embossed as well as being an, a, a kind of outline. Okay, uh, so and this first, you print, first you have your, your printing of the, uh, of the branch and then on top of that, you layer on the, um, uh, the embossing. Is that how it works? Yes, it's, it's the, 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 the impulse. And then I might, again, um, I'm always thinking in terms of layers, and it could be layers of time, layers of, you know, what, that's always a very interesting idea for me. And, and I must say that this, it may be hard to understand, but very much this series was, was quite political, uh, because uh, the, there is the, the whole genre of flower paintings or botanical paintings which is usually associated with women. But you think of some of the revolutionary women and actually who have made incredible bodies of work, often because they were constrained to domestic situation. So that series was inspired by an extraordinary woman who was actually 17th century. She went off when she was widowed to Sumatra and painted this extraordinary series went off with her daughter and painted her some extraordinary and actually pivotal from a scientific point of view range of paintings, somebody called Maria Merriam. And what she did, which was revolutionary, was to paint the botanical specimens together with the insects that she found with them. And that was done with a dry brush technique. And a dry brush technique requires watercolor so dilute that quite honestly, I've done two exhibitions and it all uses the same watercolors that I've put on one white plate. So it's very, very dilute and the brushes are two eyelashes and you wipe them clean each time and you build up slowly layer upon layer upon layer of very, very dilute watercolor until it can build, it's not particularly in this end, it builds into something quite rich in terms of color. It can be quite precise. Right. And um, obviously, Maria Merriam does it in a way that you might, uh, you might recognize, I've got a book here, uh, you know, the kind of detail and exquisite variation that she gets through this technique is absolutely astonishing. Um, so that was an interesting, uh, an, an interesting sort of avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, there's and, a comment, uh, uh, there's a, I just want to share a couple of comments with you. Uh, Carol says about your stitching uh, piece earlier, marvelous in progress, but also already complete as is. So here you are. And uh, Bridget says that she <laughs> loved the work in progress. It makes me think of a fossil and the wonderful press detail uh, they have. So yes. Um, ah. 
but I will, I will I, keep going. Yes, yeah. uh, I'm mindful of the, uh, the time. We started a bit late, so we're going to carry on for a few minutes, but I'd like to do two things. Um, the first thing is I'd like you to share with us the um, Woodland Trust project. And oh. after that, I would like to, because it's few of us, and I like to do that when it's few of us, I'd like to open the floor and have live conversation uh, between the artist and the audience. I think it's one of the privileges of, of being together like that, even though it's online that we can talk to each other. So share with us uh, the Woodland Trust project, if you would mind. Okay, that was uh, that was a, a project that it, um, it, it's going and it will it will go on for very much longer. Where the Woodland Trust uh, and actually we had the idea, I had the idea. So just sitting behind me in that chair, <laughs> I remember that at the time we were talking about uh, ways of animating a wonderful project the uh, Woodland Trust was doing in the National Forest. Uh, so they were planting a woodland to commemorate uh, Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee. So 60 years on the throne. And they wanted to, they're planting a brand new woodland. It was very interesting because it was connecting two sections of the National Forest through open cast mining and arable farmland to create a sort of a nature um, alleyway, if you like. And uh, again, speaking with the Woodland Trust, uh, what uh, we, we talked about, what the, you know, the, uh, I was advocating because I love it so much, land art. So artwork that was actually situated and integrated with, with the landscape as a way of making people engaged with, the, uh, with what, what they were doing. So we created a project where uh, they planted all these trees and we, uh, among the people who were planting the trees, identified a young family, two little boys, a mother, mum and dad, who had come along to help plant the trees. And what we've done is situated a platform in the forest and then a plinth where a camera that defines precisely the camera position. And we're taking a photograph of that family on the same day of the year-ish, every year for the next 60 years. So we're now six years, seven years in, and you already see a little boy who wasn't even up to his dad's waist, now looking down towards his father. I mean, it's quite extraordinary how the, the family has changed already. But the idea is to actually record human years against tree years. So when we started, you could only see the family because the trees were planted as tiny little whips. Now we're starting to see trees almost as, as tall as the people. And of course, over time, they're going to be situated in a, dense, in a dense woodland. So we've created this not only to have the sequence of the slowly evolving series of photographs showing whatever is going to happen to the family, while it simultaneously shows whatever is happening to the trees behind them, it creates the opportunity for every visiting family or local family to do the same thing. And the intriguing thing about it from my point of view is we've set up this process to happen. The photographs are actually being taken by uh, a young photographer who was 23 at the time we took the, for the first photograph. And I, I, I recall, because we're setting this up to go on for 60 years, we'd had the debate about who on earth would commit themselves to do something for 60 years. And then you had to stand back and say, well, mm, the queen has. And so it seemed a very fitting tribute to the queen who had actually served, well, she's more than 60 years yeah. now. Uh, and the joyous comment from the photographer as he took the, the, the first picture, he skipped over and said, I just realized I am going to be 83 when I take the last photograph <laughs> and you'll be dead. <laughs> so, you know, interesting, but quite fascinating because it really emphasizes what I observed about trees before, that if I plant a tree now, it's not for me, may not even be for my children. Uh, it possibly for my theoretical grandchildren, but it's for people that I can't know that I have to do this. And I have to feel grateful to so many people who created the kind of things that give me joy every morning, like, the, you know, planting the trees in St. James's Park. 
Right. I mean, are you recording the, I mean, there's a whole, a whole history of the family that, that sits once a year and, and hopefully they stay together until the end, but it would be fascinating. Do you, rec do you have a, a record of the impression they're feeling at that moment year after year or how do they interact with that? Well, we've, we've just kept it. We, 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 I mean, I'm hoping that as we as we go and i think it it probably probably need 10 years so you see a substantial development before it has real poignancy so the the idea i think is compelling now the experience is probably still quite narrow um what i what i didn't say is i created uh 60 prints you know like the, of the uh, the um wildflowers in the location that was planted up as a forest which will be overlaid by a family, one portrait of the family every year, as will the wildflowers be overlaid by the canopy of the trees. So it's a, it's a kind of project of transformation and accumulating changes. Uh, in terms of, in, in a way, it's quite intrusive to ask the family too many questions about them. But I think looking at the images, we create the story. I mean, one all, already takes such pleasure in seeing these tiny boys now towering over their dad. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's quite, it's... Uh, I'm going to, um, going to gallery view here and I would love to know if anybody has, uh, has questions. We have covered so much ground here. There's a lot of uh, thoughts and, and things to, uh, to think about. Uh, Anybody with a question? Sharon? Yeah, I would like to know, on the first piece you showed us where you said the Fibonacci sequence plays into the spiral, um, can you tell us how that is? Does it have to do with the spacing of where you start the next line? Yes, I leave, I leave a little gap and I, I, I generate that. And so that's kind of a engineered, but uh, so I can find, I have, uh, I have here a little, a little image. Um, this is not great because this is, a, this is a printed version, but you can see that there's, you know, the way that it's, it, it's e echoing that different words have a different density too. So you can create a pattern that is not just the space, but, you know, you, you'll see darker things just because certain words have a different density because of where the letters uh, fall together. And so it's just, if you like, it's a little, a little in-joke, but I think it also communicate something, um, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we're explicitly aware of it or not, because we all know that that spiral can just continue to expand infinitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beatrice. Um, I would be interested in, in hearing about your relationship with your, with your dealer, who happens to be here as well, and, and how you sort of feed on each other or how you your you know andrea sort of encourages you in one direction or another or you know the the relationship that so of course andrea can also speak to this yeah well I, sh I should start by saying i regard myself as the luckiest artist in the entire world um i cannot tell you how fabulous it is to have andrea as a I'm not sure what to put first, um, the dealer or friend, because I don't like to think of it as a product. I think I'm, I have to say as a, as a friend, because what I, what I know about her is her taste and her engagement is second to none. So I will always show ideas or plays or you know, any footling around that I'm doing to Andrea and no, I will get really interesting and useful feedback. Um, and it can be good or it can be no. <laughs> but that's incredibly useful, I cannot tell you. I also find uh, she's really wonderful um, in um, embellishing my work okay because of what she puts it next to so you can see that i'm playing with layers well 
Andrea creates cascades and sequence of meaning by curating objects together, so different artists work, that give my things a meaning that I hadn't noticed, but is quite, makes really wonderful conversation. So, I, I mean, I have to thank her for so many things, um, but, you know, it basically making me look a lot better than I would otherwise. Andrea, you have to reply to that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, my dear Patricia. No, I, well, first of all, I love Patricia's works as all the, the artists that I show in the gallery. That goes without saying. Secondly, you know, with the works, I've, I've known Patricia since she finished art school. So I think that was two, 2007. You build a relationship. And with Patricia and with all of the artists, you know, you see, I come with the projects and I come with ideas. Sometimes, you know, they come with the projects and ideas. And, but, you know, uh, I can say I'm organizing a show in, I don't know when, in November, and it's called this. And these, you know, and I would like some works for that. And to be honest, we discuss the works, but I never know exactly what's going to, what works will arrive, you know, until the day they arrive in the gallery. So it's, you know, of course, artists show me the works and, you know, throughout all the artists' careers, you know, there's some that are better than others, but you always know that they are part of the progress and part of the, ex, you know, experimenting and finding, you know, maybe those are not as strong as others, but then something stronger will come out in the end. So, you know, you always have to, I think, you know, I accompany that development, if you want, or that progress. But I'm always surprised uh, when the works arrive. And then Patricia says that I, you know, hang the works, you know, enhance the works. You know, I think the works, they all enhance each other. They fall very, you know, naturally next to each other in the gallery. It's, you know, it always happens like that. Yeah, but I think Andrea is um, understating her, her contribution because I think we've all gone to lots of galleries where we feel we're walking through a catalog um, of random associations, whereas Andrea always curates spaces so that you can see the dialogue among the artists and between the pieces. And it's, uh, it's a very, very valuable uh, gift to any artist to have work shown to, to advantage. You know, you can kill things. Uh, and, and I think we've all seen galleries where that happens. I, I couldn't Thank agree you. more. Any yeah. more questions? No? Well, uh, I want to thank you all. It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful session. Thank you so very much, Patricia, for your, uh, your time and for taking us through your work. I think there's a lot to, uh, to think about in, uh, in today's uh, discussion and, and uh, go, I encourage you to go on to uh, Patricia's website and on to uh, Jager London website too. You can see uh, Patricia's work there. You'll also see other artists that we have interviewed uh, before with whom we had conversation and there's an exhibit going on at the moment. And I see that uh, Bridget is there uh, with us too. And I think you are also showing uh, at uh, Jagadart. So, you know, as always, go and, uh, go and discover the artist. Uh, thank you again, Patricia and Andrea. And have and, all the well, great Well, thank to all of you for listening. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.